Tonight we're focusing in on Zoom with Galaxy AI on the new Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Ah, a baby tiger. Check out his claws as he prepares to pounce on that frog. Close one, but not as close as this Zoom. We can literally count the whiskers and... Oh look, Mum's here. Good thing I'm nowhere nearby. Go wild with Galaxy AI on the new S24 Ultra and zoom in on the epic day or night. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Today on CityCast Pittsburgh, a bridge collapsed in Baltimore, and we're wondering whether something similar could ever play out here. Mayor Ed Ganey is trying once again to generate taxes from UPMC and other exempt properties, and a new medical drama based in Pittsburgh is in the works. Plus, we've got some Easter news, a comprehensive plan, and why Groundhog's Day just got a little bit fuzzier. It's March 29th, the Friday News Roundup. I'm Megan Harris, and here's what Pittsburgh's talking about. I'm with CityCast Mallory Falk and Sophia Lowe. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Mallory, welcome back to the podcast. I think this is your first official return to the microphone. It is. Uh, my daughter was born back in December, so I've been hanging out with her. Congrats. Thank you. She's um, very cute. She's got good cheeks. Good cheeks. She had great hair, but it's gradually fallen out. Oh, no. <laughs> Falling out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's been great having time to hang out with her, but it's nice to see both of your faces again. And to get a glimpse at your closet. Always fun. We have really fun recording setups in the background here for everyone. <laughs> Um, Now that you're getting back into the swing of things, is there any piece of Pittsburgh news that's really grabbed your attention this week? Well, maybe not the newsiest item out there, but the very first thing I saw in my inbox when I logged back in was one of the sillier press releases I've ever received. Um, (laughs) You know, we're always getting emails about Pittsburgh being like the eighth best mid-sized city for a quickie getaway or the 46th best city for thrifting. Yes, those are real examples. Um, (laughs) And apparently, according to Wallet Hub, we are this year's best city to celebrate Easter. Okay, I would have never thought about ranking cities for best Easter, but how does someone even figure that out? Yeah, so Wallet Hub has like a ton of different metrics, and we ranked in the top 10 for a few of them. So probably unsurprisingly, there's how many churches there are per capita and what percentage of the population is Christian. We're obviously a very Catholic city. Um, They also looked at how many candy stores and flower shops there are Mm -hmm. in the city. And then this one I found a little perplexing. Easter weather was a factor and Pittsburgh (laughs) came in third place. I kind of like that. Like, that's maybe the only measure of Pittsburgh weather that feels both fair and also fun. Like, we came out on top. (laughs) I don't know. Out of 100 cities, we really have the third best weather. I mean, maybe. Like, because everybody's weather sucks a little bit more in the spring. So, like, it makes it easier for us. That's true, but it's just gray here. It's not always gray. It has been sunny some of the week. I'll take it. (laughs) Fair enough. Well, I'm looking at the full article now. And while we have higher rankings for everything else, we are 96th for kids Easter rank. And when I think of Easter, I think of bunnies and egg hunts. So I don't know if we can have the best Easter while being so close to dead last for kids activities. I noticed that too, Sophia. I'm really confused by that. Maybe this is, you know, if you're um, 50 and above, it's a great place to celebrate the holiday. I'm not quite sure. Um, And I don't know, I was trying to think about what else might set us apart. And I don't know if Lent would factor into this at all, but I I would wager that we probably have the most fish fries per capita. And so maybe that didn't seem like an official Wallet Hub metric, but I wonder if that plays a part. I mean, I could absolutely see that being a big part of it. Like we're good for like your granny's Easter, (laughs) not necessarily for your nephews, you know? (laughs) Yeah. And you could grab your last fish fries of the year today. That's true. Today's the day. It's Good Friday if you are, you know, of that persuasion. Um, So let's talk about some real news. Sorry, Wallet Hub. Um, And what's been happening in Pittsburgh this week? Sophia, what have you been focused on? I saw that Mayor Ganey is planning to challenge a bunch of nonprofits on their tax exempt status. And the big one, of course, is UPMC. Yeah, this is the second list of targets from the city. Uh, They did the first one last year. UPMC has been a big part of both rounds. Um, So 
Just so everybody knows what we're talking about, the city has been looking at these big lists of all the properties that don't have to pay taxes. So that could be like churches and schools, but also businesses maybe that operate as nonprofits for various reasons. Um, So the city's trying to figure out how many of them are legit. And in a city like Pittsburgh, where a huge portion of our available land is owned by a nonprofit hospital system like UPMC, it's making a really big dent in our tax rolls. Yeah, and the city's new What's Good Pittsburgh newsletter officials say they want these nonprofits to, quote, pay their fair share in property taxes on land that is not serving the purpose of a purely public charity, Uh, end quote. So there's more funding for public services. One example they put in there is trash collection. It's like a low key burn. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I did see that a lot of the UPMC properties that are being challenged are parking lots and garages. And as someone who probably just spent more on parking for my prenatal appointments than on my child's actual birth. No. um, I mean, slight exaggeration, but, you know, it was a good chunk of change. And I've kind of been wondering how those paid lots um, are considered public charity when you have to pay. Um, But did the city say how much tax revenue they're hoping to get back on the books? So, Sophia, correct me if I'm wrong. I think this time around they're challenging um, 100 properties, so way more than last time. Um, And the city said if every one of them comes through, they won't. But if they did, it would be $6.4 million per year in taxes. Um, So, you know, that's the thing with this is that it's sort of a long game. Um, Besides UPMC, Ganey's also looking at properties owned by Allegheny General Hospital. So fair is fair, Mm -hmm. both of them. Um, Some universities like Pitt, CMU, Duquesne, Mm -hmm. um, and some other spaces. That is a lot of money. Um, You mentioned this is the second time the Ganey administration is challenging nonprofits. So can you remind us how it went the first time around? Not that well, in my opinion. So last year, 2023, the Ganey admin challenged 27 properties. Uh, About half of them failed. Three Mm. were withdrawn and the rest succeeded. So I don't know, maybe like a C minus. Um, And at the end of the day, the city got $100,000 worth of property tax back. Um, But KDK reported that it cost them $400,000 to get a firm to help them with this whole process. (laughs) Not the most cost effective. I mean, in their defense, that means at least these properties are now going to be contributing taxes in the future. So we're losing money short term to have the fight, but longer term, and we're getting more money, I guess. Um, I mean, negotiating with UPMC and others sure isn't getting it done. So, yeah, I mean, we've spent years asking them to chip in and that's gone nowhere. So it did seem like the time had come to try another tactic. And this allows them to try that tactic with a bunch of different places, too. So it's, mm-hmm. it's an interesting strategy. But for what it's worth, the city says it doesn't need this money immediately to like balance its books. Uh, but you're right, Megan. Um, and the deputy mayor is saying all of this is happening, quote, to ensure the long term success of the city of Pittsburgh and the long term thriving of its residents and that our tax system is based on an accurate and fair understanding of who should be paying what, end quote. Once again, I think I listened to all those quotes with like a very specific tone of voice and it makes them more fun. (laughs) Um, But there are challenges coming to the city. Like, I understand why they're saying that. It's because we were in Act 47 not that long ago um, by Municipal Memories, um, which was a very bad financial position for uh, any city in Pennsylvania to be in. Um, So, you know, looking ahead, we've got pandemic relief funds that are ending. A lot of commercial property owners have been challenging their tax bills lately and winning. Every time one of those spaces wins, it's just a little less money for city services um, and our city schools. Yeah. Public Source has actually been doing some great reporting on all of that if you want to dig deeper into property assessments. But the short version is that our leaders are very clearly worried about the downstream effects of all this. But back to the direct negotiations, uh, there is another way to get more money from these nonprofits, and that would be figuring out voluntary payments in lieu of taxes. And this is when the nonprofits just give the city money without changing their tax exemptions. Yeah. And I mean, just to underscore it, Ganey is going for a bunch of places, but UPMC is the big one just because of how much money they generate and how much property they own. Um, Lots of folks think that they should be paying taxes. 
Yeah. And with UPMC, one number I'm just going to throw out there is that the Children's Hospital would pay $3.4 million in taxes per year wow. if that's successfully challenged in this round. That's according to public source. Um, but again, UPMC isn't all big functional buildings with lots of operations. Mallory, like you said, a lot of what's being challenged are parking lots. So I don't know, maybe those are the ones that are more likely to go through. I also think it's worth talking about UPMC, like just keeping this in the back of your mind as you see headlines pop for this, their overall business strategy. So for years, they've had the hospitals, the insurance company and enterprises, um, which enterprises is how they invest in stuff like healthcare technology concepts, businesses, that kind of thing. Um, But right before the pandemic hit, they were talking about opening a fourth arm, a pharmaceutical company. The the name that they used at the time was UPMC Pharma. I think they were kind of kidding. Um, (laughs) But can you imagine a pharmaceutical company operating as a nonprofit? In this country, yes, sadly. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Two radically different answers. <laughs> Two different reactions. I guess, yes, I see how someone would argue for that. But no, that's not a nonprofit. <laughs> that was just my low expectations for any kind of regulation in this country. Obviously, I find it out as outrageous as the rest of you. Yeah. So, I mean, there's there's the legal question, but I think it's interesting how the city is going about this debate. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out long term. Yeah, and this is just the very beginning of this next wave of challenges. The city newsletter says they're still reviewing more properties, and this is going to be an ongoing process where they'll be submitting more tax challenges as they're ready. Hey, Pittsburgh. I know a lot of yins have been protesting lately. And if you want to get more involved in social justice, but just don't know where to start, check out YWCA of Greater Pittsburgh's Racial Justice Challenge. It's the whole month of April, and you'll have the opportunity to complete one short racial justice activity every weekday, diving deeper into issues of race, power, privilege, and leadership. And there are different kinds of modules, so you'll get to explore ideas about about bodily autonomy, financial empowerment, caregiving, gun violence, even access to transportation. Plus, you're invited to join in-person discussion groups every Friday all month long at YWCA Greater Pittsburgh in the Southside. Learn more and sign up at ywcapgh.org. Okay, Mallory, what about you? What have you been paying attention to this week other than Easter celebrations, of course? (laughs) (laughs) Well, obviously, um, a big national story this week was the Baltimore Bridge collapse. And um, I'm probably not the only person whose thoughts turn to our own kind of raggedy bridges here in Pittsburgh, um, wondering if we have something else to fear when we're crossing them besides all the other reasons uh, we feel like we're taking our lives into our own hands when we cross our bridges. Yeah. Yeah. Mallory, while you were out, I went to like a three plus hour long board meeting about the causes of the Fern Hollow Bridge collapse. And that scared me enough. So you better not be telling me I need to worry about more bridges falling down for other reasons. I'm still so sorry, Sophia. We did not need to task you with that. (laughs) It's okay. It's been haunting your dreams ever since. Exactly. I mean, it does give you a lot to think about when crossing any bridge in the city of Pittsburgh. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us have at least a little bit of bridge anxiety. Um, But I do have some good news for you, Sophia. It seems like it's pretty unlikely that we'd see a bridge collapse here after a boat collision specifically. Yeah, I mean, for so many reasons, right? Like we have very low bridges, um, so only barges and those smaller boats can even pass through, not giant multi-level cargo ships like the one in Baltimore. Um, And we also have really small old river locks and dams. um, So even if the bridges were higher, they still probably couldn't navigate through there. It's just we weren't built for that kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean, to recap for anyone who did somehow miss the news, um, the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed on Tuesday morning after it got hit by a container ship. So exactly the kind of ship, Megan, you were saying, like, can't really come through here. Yeah, the big guys. It's early days, so we don't know yet exactly what happened, but it seems like the ship lost power at some point. Um, And as of this recording, two bodies have been recovered and four more people are presumed dead. Um, All construction workers who were repairing potholes on the bridges. Yeah, it's really tragic. It's just awful. I, I know people have been rescued and I'm glad for that, but it's just so tragic that people died filling potholes. Like, damn. Yeah. They were really like they were trying to make the city better. 
Yeah, like working on the kind of repairs that are supposed to help keep people safe. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it'll probably be a while before we know exactly what caused this. But I mean, even if we don't have cargo ships, we have boats. We have big things like the Gateway Clipper. Um, I know that's still smaller than the kind of ship that collided with the uh, bridge in Baltimore. But again, just thinking about the board meeting, about the Fern Hollow collapse, I don't have a ton of faith in our infrastructure, even if it's a smaller ship. Yeah. And I mean, we do have a lot of barges on our rivers, you know, carrying things like coal and crude materials. Um, I was doing a little research for this segment and stumbled on a piece in City Paper last year with the headline, Where the Heck Are Pittsburgh's River Barges Going? by Jamie Wigan. <laughs> it says that more than 16 million tons of freight move through the port of Pittsburgh every year, which makes us one of the largest inland ports in the U.S. in terms of volume. Um, if you want to learn more about our river barges, it's a delightful read. Um, but yeah, so there definitely are uh, vessels on our waters, just not these giant ones. So even if they're not giant vessels, could a vessel carrying enough stuff still make a bridge collapse? I mean, the barges hit our bridges all the dang time. Um, they oh, just did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I wondered if you knew that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there have been a bunch. Um, gosh, one not even that long ago. I think it was the Rankin Bridge. Yeah, I actually saw um, in a Trib article by friend of the pod, Ryan Dito, that there have been like, you know, several over the past decade or so, including that one. But those bridges are still standing. So, um, so far, no collisions have brought us down. Um, and, you know, he also noted, for what it's worth, that all the bridges in the Pittsburgh area that span the Allegheny, Monongahela, or Ohio are currently graded in fair or good condition by PennDOT. So we don't have any that at least seem like a little tap from a barge would immediately cause it to crumble into the water. Yeah. And just to put that into perspective, too, like the barges are very small by comparison to those huge cargo ships. Um, Mallory and I were both trying to figure out how much these things weigh. Um, but just to give some perspective, um, it, I, there were some waterway FAQs and a barge rental business that I checked out. I didn't know you could rent them. That's amazing to me. Um, but it said most barges tap out like without cargo, nothing at 3,200 tons. Uh -huh. um, but the Dolly, the AP reports that without any of its containers, of which it had many, if you've seen the videos, it was 95,000 tons. So like just the sheer weight and force of this thing hitting a bridge is so different than anything that could ever be in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And, you know, just to clarify, the dolly is the ship that hit the bridge. So Sophia, do you feel better or worse now? I, I guess I feel a little better about Pittsburgh bridges. <laughs> just a little. <laughs> this is the first time you've ever said that sentence. <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's wrap up this week with a little Pittsburgh pop culture update. Uh, our Fair City is getting its very own medical drama from the same team that made the old TV show ER. It's going to be a 15 episode series on Max or HBO. Um, it's going to be called The Pit. I can't get over the name. The Pit. Why? <laughs> That's the university. I've been here for a little over a year now and I've learned that. But The Pit is still different. That would be like the Ohio State. I hate it. <laughs> That's true. Yes, yes. Fair enough. I'm ashamed to admit this, but I actually thought the title was a teeny bit clever because, you know, emergency rooms are referred to as the pit. Thank you, Grey's Anatomy, for this and all of my medical knowledge. <laughs> but most people don't have that medical knowledge. so You can't figure out what the show's even about with just that title. I mean, I'm sure there'll be some fun clip art or dramatic like scenes in the background that'll let you know whatever it is. Um, anyway, according to the press release, The Pit is a realistic examination of the challenges facing healthcare workers in today's America, uh, seen through the lens of the frontline heroes working in a modern day hospital in Pittsburgh. I really don't understand how we haven't just reached the saturation point with medical dramas. Um, right. I mean, we have it with cops. We have it with firefighters or emergency medical services. There's even one about 911 dispatchers right now. <laughs> I watched the premiere and that was one episode too many for me. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually think this one might get a little more attention and maybe like a bigger viewership because it's from the team behind ER. Um, and it also stars Noah Wiley, who played one of ER's major characters, John Carter. So it's kind of seems legit. I had no idea it had him until you told me about it. I'm so excited. <laughs> I might actually watch it now. <laughs> his, his star power outweighs the horrendous uh, title. 
Look, I loved him in a separate series called The Librarian, but I also cannot express to you how much I watched ER as a young child. Everyone in my family is in the medical profession, and they would play this game where, you know, in like the first five minutes, somebody comes in with some terrible emergency and they try to diagnose it like live <laughs> with the TV. And it was very funny. And I was it, I was terrible at it. Obviously, I was a small child and had no training, but it was like burned in my brain. Honestly, that sounds kind of fun because like it's like I can't do that because I have no medical knowledge, but it's like in Chopped when the baskets come out, I try to make a dish before all yes, the chefs it's do. it's exactly like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but back to the TV show, do you know why they chose Pittsburgh as the setting? Mallory, have you seen anything? I, I The Trib had something um, that the executive producer, John Wells, graduated from CMU, the School of Drama back in the 70s. Um, so I don't know. Maybe he just like has a special place in his heart for for Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's about all that I could find. Maybe that's the connection. Um, I mean, my main question is actually whether this will be filmed in Pittsburgh or th if this is kind of a queer as folk situation where that show was set here but filmed in Toronto, which, oh, yeah. you know, I, makes me question the authenticity. Um, <laughs> anyway, it looks like the head of the Pittsburgh Film Office told KDK that as of right now, at least there aren't plans to film here. If there are plans to film here, y'all mind if I take time off to try to be an extra in the show? I mean, I'm I'm in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> this also sounds like a city cast episode. How to get cast as an extra. Spot the Sophia. <laughs> yeah, or, or spot the Sophia. <laughs> um, well, until then, I do have a fun little challenge for the two of you. I found a post about this show on Pittsburgh Reddit where people were coming up with ideas for Pittsburgh-centric storylines. Um, it all started because this one user, Sia Operation 7215, mentioned how medical dramas come up with all of these absurd challenges tragic accidents like yeah. on Grey's Anatomy which is set mm -hmm. in Seattle there was a ferry boat crash so they said I'm eager to see what Pittsburgh tragedies and characters the writers will drum up and if they will be even remotely realistic um people started weighing in with ideas like a sinkhole episode an episode where a freight train falls on a tea station which actually happened here you might remember just a few years ago thankfully no one was hurt yep no one was right. hurt though <laughs> so i would like to hear your pitches uh if you were in the writer's room for the pit what pittsburgh storyline would you pitch Okay, Mallory, unlike you, I remembered absolutely nothing related to medicine or healthcare from Grey's Anatomy. No clue that the emergency room could also be called the pit. I only remember all the romantic drama. So my pitch is also about hot doctors. Give me a rivals to lovers plot line between surgeons at UPMC and AHN. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. The Sophia. only thing is that I don't think 15 episodes is long enough for a slow burn on this. <laughs> Sophia, I don't want to encourage you to leave this job, but I also think maybe you do need to submit this to <laughs> the pit writer's room. What do you two have? Well, to bring it full circle, my idea would be that the city tries to challenge the tax exempt status of this hospital, mainly because I would be really curious to see who gets cast as Ed Gainey in the fictionalized version. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's actually very similar to an idea from my partner. I'm terrible at this sort of thing, but I think that he could like low key be like a Hallmark movie writer. I think he's like untapped potential there. Uh, Mallory, he he had a similar idea, but he said that they should just have sheriff's deputies come in and lock all the doors. And then where do all the sick people go? Because they shut down the building. No, that seems <laughs> more, upsetting. more upsetting than what I was imagining. I know, but it's got to be dramatic, right? Um, I liked it. There was another one. Um, the drama would be like, that a that someone on the hospital board falls for the mayor and they have to keep their relationship a secret as their rivals. No, we love Michelle Ganey. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the real Ed Ganey. <laughs> um, uh, my partner's other ideas were that it could be marathon day and suddenly the sun comes out and it's much hotter than expected and people get terrible sunburns or heat exhaustion. <laughs> That one feels a little too real. <laughs> well, we would love to know what your ideas are. Uh, first of all, will you be tuning in to The Pit? Do you have strong feelings about, I don't know, emergency medical dramas film, filmed on or around about the city? Let us know via email at pittsburgh at citycast.fm, or you can call or text us 412-212-8893. So before we head out, uh, what will Yins be watching for over the next week? Could be a moment of joy, a news story. What, do you, what are you going to be thinking about over the weekend. Well, in case you missed it, Punxsutawney Phil and his wife Phyllis are the proud parents of two baby groundhogs. 
<laughs> I've never felt more connected to Punxsutawney Phyllis. <laughs> well, Phil better not be a deadbeat dad because according to the official Groundhog Club lore, he's immortal and Phyllis is not. Um, TBD on whether his children will live forever. The Groundhog Club's website still says that Phil doesn't have children. So someone on that team, update that. Y'all, if you missed our Groundhog's Day episode, please go back. Uh, Sophia really did the most about Phil facts and things you should know about Pennsylvania's most famous groundhog. Do we know their names? I don't think the babies have names yet, at least not on the uh, Phil's Facebook page, which is where I saw this news. Um, So you can go there if you want to look at pictures or visit them at the library in Punxsutawney. I will be waiting for cuter photos when the groundhogs get fuzzier. Yeah, fair. (laughs) Megan, what about you? Uh, I've been looking at all the plans for what the city is calling its first ever comprehensive plan process. Um, So it's not totally clear what they're going to be looking for out of all of this. It sounds like it's kind of a big pie in the sky thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But it seems to be largely focused around climate justice. So creating a cleaner environment, a more just economy here in Pittsburgh. And they are looking for folks to weigh in in all kinds of different ways. So there's a link to sign up to stay in the loop. We'll put that in our show notes. And mine. So amid my disappointment that the pit probably won't be filmed in Pittsburgh, um, (laughs) I did remember that I still haven't watched A League of Their Own, which is the TV series that came out a couple of years ago based on that iconic film about a women's baseball league. Um, That was actually filmed right here in Pittsburgh. The stars and creators gave our city a lot of love. So I might finally try to watch it this weekend because I've heard great things and I'm a couple years late on uh, giving it a shot. It's really good. It's got some nice dramatic slow burn romance for you. I'm stoked for you. That's all for today here on CityCast Pittsburgh. Reminder, you can find all of our shows, old and new, on our website. That's pittsburgh.citycast.fm. Our music is by Benji. Mallory Falk is our executive producer. The show was produced this week by Sophia Lowe, Mary Lee Williams, Lizzie Goldsmith, Grant Irving, Elizabeth Kama, and A.K. Almumen. Francesca DeBecco and Adrian Gonzalez wrote and edited the newsletter, and I'm your host, Megan Harris. We'll be back on Monday with more news from around the city. Have a great weekend, everyone. I've never felt more connected to Monks and Tony Phil. Phyllis. 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 <laughs> Phyllis did all the work. Can I retake that so I don't sound sexist? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can also leave that in. That's fine. Um. <laughs> <laughs>